I should like to draw your attention to the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 11, and verse 1. The Gospel of Matthew, chapter 11, and verse 1. Matthew 1, 11. When Jesus had finished instructing his twelve disciples, he went on from there to teach and preach in their cities. Now when John heard in prison about the deeds of the Christ, he sent word by his disciples and said to him, Are you the one who is to come, or shall we look for another? And Jesus answered them, Go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight, and the lame walk, Leopards are cleansed, and the deaf hear, and the dead are raised up, and the poor have good news preached to them. And blessed is the one who is not offended by me. Well, it might be John that we are offended by. It might be John the Baptist who offers us the most offense in this verse. For before we have known John the Baptist as a very bold and courageous preacher, calling the people of Israel to repentance, and when the Pharisees and the scribes showed up, the self-righteous leaders of the religious people of that time who were leading the people astray, he called them a brood of vipers. He is the one who is in prison because he stood up to the ruler of the land and spoke out against his immoral actions without apology. And yes, this is the same John the Baptist who saw Jesus come into him and said, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. This is the same John the Baptist who refused at first to baptize Jesus, knowing who he was and finding himself unworthy to perform the act. And when compelled to do it, he was there when the Father spoke from heaven and the Spirit descended in the form of a dove upon the Son of God is born witness to Jesus' ministry at the very beginning, when he is affirmed as the Messiah by Father and by Holy Ghost, and is anointed with the Spirit without measure. Now he is in prison. Now life has got a bit harder, though his life was never easy. Now his bold proclamation has found him here. And we are disappointed. Where has his boldness gone? Where is his courage? Where is his conviction, his resolve? What has happened to his faith? He has this question. And what brings the question about? Why is that he has heard of Jesus, it seems? He is in prison and he hears of Jesus. Well, isn't the hearing of it enough? Perhaps we ourselves would become a little self-righteous and begin to judge John the Baptist. Oh, you used to really be something, John, but you've fallen apart here. You used to really be something, but now that you've come upon hard times, you've let slip your face. Now we see you're flawed. You're only human. Perhaps you are not so much a human as we are. Perhaps we like to beat up on John at this point so that we can elevate ourselves. Perhaps we do it not only to John, but to other great men. Why, we could look back at Adam and Eve and their fall in the garden and berate them for doing what we do every day. Perhaps we could berate Cain for his treatment of Abel. Perhaps we might berate Noah for, yes, he built the ark, fearing the wrath of God that was to come, and he preached boldly, though people mocked him and scorned what he had to say and did not believe and would not repent. But then after all is said and done, we find him drunk. Or Abraham, who trusted in God enough, believed that he would be given a son, though he was past age, who believed even though his wife laughed, who believed in God enough to leave his own country, trusting that God would bring him into the country, the promised land that he had not known. But then there were times that Abraham did not trust God, and he relied upon his own wit, and he lied, not once, but twice. And we might find fault with the other patriarchs. We might find fault with Moses, who doubted at the first 
that God could do the mighty work that he called Moses to do. We could berate him when he faces the rock a second time and fails to follow instructions. And what of Aaron and the golden calf? Yes, we could find many faults with David and with Solomon. We could see Elijah once bold, mocking the prophets of Baal and calling down fire from heaven, but then we should turn the page to the next chapter and see him hiding in a cave. We are disappointed in one sense, but in another sense we are very glad. We like to see the great men fall. We like to look ahead and make fun with Peter as he tries to walk on water only to find himself beneath the waves. We like to see him when he boldly, foolishly proclaims, I will not betray you. I will be right there the whole time, no matter what they do. And then we see him re renounce his Lord, denying him three times. We see him more mature, the rock upon which the church is being built. They love that episode where Paul must go in and correct him. Oh, and what if Paul, the apostle to we Gentiles, perhaps he is our favorite outside of Jesus, but even he has his moments, his moments of weakness, his thorn in the flesh, that time that he despaired of life. We like that he calls himself the chief of sinners, not for the reason that he tells us we should like it, because if he is a chief, then it cannot be we who are the chief. Yes, and we like to see the church fathers in their folly, and we like to point out the flaws of the reformers and of the Puritans. We like to put down the great men of history to elevate ourselves up. But if we do that here, we shall miss the point, and the point is good for us. For the fact of the matter is that we aren't any better than John the Baptist. We're not any better than Elijah or David or Solomon or Paul or Peter or any of them. We are humans as they are. There's only one man in the Bible who is above these moments of doubt and confusion, who is above wondering and asking questions, who is above being overwhelmed and cast into despair, who never ceases to act according to the principles and the precepts of faith, and he is Jesus Christ. It is he that we learn about, he who shines through in the moment of John's weakness, who redeems that moment of doubt, who takes this question that might seem blasphemous and turns it into yet another opportunity of ministry, one that has lasted John the Baptist longer than his life, much longer than any man's life, one that we still benefit from today. But if we are to benefit of it, we must let go our pretenses of pride. And we must look for instruction. And we must look for revelation. We must look for admonishment and for encouragement. And may God help us in this. Let me pray. Father, may you reveal yourself in this text putting down our foolish pride and teaching us a lesson that shall serve us well all the days of our lives. Speak to our hearts, to draw us near to thee. Let us know the truth of the testimony then and now. Father, only you can do it. I am but a branch, you are divine. To you be all the glory and honor, dominion, as you alone are worthy. Have your way in Jesus' name. Amen. Jesus has just finished sending out his disciples to go and do more of the work which he himself is about doing. And the work is multiplying. The ministry is expanding. It is going further. It seems a moment for encouragement, for rejoicing, a moment of victory. But here we find John in prison, perhaps feeling defeated, perhaps wondering what shall come next, wondering if it had all been worth it. Looking back over the actions that have led him here and the actions that seem likely to follow and trying to weigh them all in the balance. And he has a question upon hearing of the works of Jesus. And his question is, is it really true? Are you really who you say you are, O Son of God? 
Are these things really still happening? Is there yet hope? In the midst of this dark dungeon of despair, does the light still shine, though it shines but dimly upon me, but dimly to my dim eyes? Is it true? Has it all been worth it? And we might berate him for asking the question, but if we do, it shows only that we are very unhealthy people and that we do not understand what the Christian life really is. There are, as it has been said, two kinds of Christians, those who don't have questions and those who have questions and ask them. That last is the healthy kind. Do not be above asking questions, for John the Baptist is not, though Jesus is about to say that he is the greatest of all the prophets, that there is no one like him who was born of a woman. Jesus is about to speak very, very highly of him, and yet there is nothing here to berate him for asking this question. Though it might seem an insult or an accusation, it is not acted in that tone. No, the tone is that of a man who is wondering, who needs reassurance. He is like the man who came to Jesus saying, Lord, I believe, help my unbelief. He is looking for help. In all humility, it is a right attitude and a good attitude and one that we should not hesitate to show, display, even if we are in a place of leadership. Do not think that just because you are a preacher or a teacher or a pastor or an elder or a deacon, just because you are a mother or father or an instructor of any kind, just because you have people in authority under you, does not mean he cannot have a moment of doubt. That it is wrong for you to ask a question, or it is wrong for people to see that you have asked a question. No, friends, especially you men, brothers, let them see that you ask. Let them know that you go before the Lord to get help. You are not strong by trying to build up an appearance of strength. That is vanity. You are strong when you rely upon the strength of him who is invincibly strong. The greatest ministry you can have is in teaching people how to seek the one who will be found by those who seek him. John here is showing us something of the promise of Matthew 7. It shall be answered. Before it is, let us note that he doesn't disguise it not from his disciples, those who study under him, those who look to him as a mentor, those whose ministry, those who sit under his ministry, those that he ministers most to. He not only lets them see, but he entrusts the question to them and he enlists their aid. Now, beloved, we are very blessed to have the Holy Spirit in us so that we might go to Jesus in prayer at any time. And we have his word complete and full, illuminated by the Holy Spirit, so that we might receive his answer as soon as we had opened the book. But still it is good that we should entrust our friends with us. Yes, even our disciples, whether they be our children or the members of our Sunday school class or our fellow deacons or elders, whether it be the whole of the congregation, let them see something of it. And let them help you. Let them pray for you. Let them petition God on your behalf as you petition God on theirs. It is a good thing to bear one another's burdens. That is the commandment of the kingdom for great and small, for those who are in power and those who are under authority, for all of us in the body. It is a wonderful thing, a great privilege and a great help that God has provided for us. And surely it shall be rewarded. For as we have mentioned in Matthew 7, Jesus says the one who seeks will find, the one who knocks it will be open to him, the one who asks it will be given them. Well, John here is asked, and Jesus answers. Jesus answers him. He does not answer him harshly. He does not come to this bruised reed and try to crush the life out of it and go, you bruised reed. 
How dare you be bruised? How dare you have this moment of doubt? How dare you falter on the path? Aren't you strong enough to be my disciple? You can't, you can't ask this question. No, friends, he does not say that. He welcomes the question. He does not have any rebuke. He does not come to the smoking flax and say, I see that the embers are burning low. Let me snuff them out. Rather, he handles these bruised reeds gently with an understanding touch. And he would heal them and see them restored. And the smoking flax, he does not snuff it out, but he fans the embers back into the fullness of flame that this man might complete his race well. And what he has done for John the Baptist, he also does for Peter, and he does for Paul, and he did for Elijah, and for David and Solomon and Moses. He did it for Abraham. He has done it for all of us. For in Christ there is a grace sufficient for all of our needs, sufficient in all of our moments of weakness. When we are weak, we are strongest, for then his strength comes through. Remember, he said that he has not chosen many who are strong or wise or wealthy, many whom the world would esteem, so that he might befuddle the wisdom of the world and show its strength to be weakness. No, oh, friends, do not fear to come to a Lord who well knows who you are, who knows what human frailty is, who has faced every temptation and overcome. Do not think that you will find him a hard master. For he bids you come, all who are weary and heavy laden, and he will give you rest. And so he gives John. He gives John rest. And what is it that he gives him? He does not tell him that all will be as he should like it to be. He does not say the doors of the prison are now opening. And John is walking out. He does not say the king is dying and shall soon be gone. And this woman who will ask for the head of this great man, she is being cut down in her prime, and her plots will go no further. No, he says none of that. John is left in prison, and his fate is coming just the same. Jesus does not miraculously go to him and give him some revelation that could not be denied. No, Jesus responds very simply. The blind recover their sight, and the lame walk. Leopards are cleansed, and the deaf hear. And the dead are raised up, and the poor have good news preached to them. John had already heard of the works of Jesus. It has just told us in verse 2 that he has heard these things have happened. He already knows this. Jesus is telling him what he already knows. He is reminding him of a truth that he has already received. Because that is what John needs. The great physician never gets the diagnosis wrong, beloved. He knows what ails you and he knows how to treat it. He speaks to you the same truths you have always known afresh. He reminds you of the things that you have forgotten, the things that are hard to hold on to. He encourages you, yes, he is who he says he is. How do you know? Because the things that only he can do are still done. It was spoken to John then. It is still spoken to us today when we become discouraged, when we wonder if it's really worth it, when we despair that the ministry of our lives has been a waste, it is still spoken, for it is still true. Good news is still preached to the poor and the power of the Holy Spirit. The power of the Holy Spirit, while well, physical eyes are not always open, the eyes of souls are, which were previously blinded by sin. Those who had no strength to walk in life are given strength to walk the straight and narrow path, so that way be rough and steep. Those who were deaf, their ears are open to the good news of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And those who were unclean, unclean as leopards, they are cleansed. 
washed by the word, washed by the grace, the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ. These things still go on as the good news is preached to those who are spiritually poor, in debt so that all they might ever hope for is eternal damnation. They receive news that relieves and restores and someday all of their physical wounds, the scars which sin inflicts upon all of our bodies, these too shall be removed. Yes, the one who came, he still comes. The one who spoke, he is still speaking. God is still with us. He is there and he is not silent. And so we are not silent. But we are not ashamed of him. And if we are not ashamed of him, then we are blessed. John was not ashamed of him, and so he was blessed, even as he was in prison. And so we see with Paul and with Peter and with all of the disciples, all of the martyrs of church history. So we saw with the prophets of old and the patriarchs. So we have seen with everyone who trusted in God, who faithfully followed until the end, who believed that he was who he said he was, and who perceive that he does all that he set out to do. The work is still done, and we are not ashamed of it, nor are we ashamed of our Lord. But if you are, if it is not enough for you that these things are done, if it is not enough that there is hope for weary, ravaged souls, borne down by the weight of the debt of sin, into hell. If that is not enough for you, if you demand also ease and wealth and health and the things that the world esteems great, that shall all be burned away in the final judgment, if you are like the people who gathered on Palm Sunday who will praise Christ so long as he serves you, and you are really ashamed of him as they were, your true colors shall show in a few days. When this Palm Sunday is past, when his triumphal entry is shown to lead not to the kind of triumphs you wanted, when you are not elevated in any way that you esteem, that you fail to perceive what has really been done, as those at the first Palm Sunday largely did. When your cries of praise and hosanna have turned to request and demands that there be crucifixion, Now well, then you shall see how ashamed you really are. If you are ashamed of him, you shall be ashamed of you on the final day. He said no less in the previous chapter. But if you trust in him, you are blessed for all things must work to your good. If you are not ashamed of him, you are blessed for you see that all of these good things have happened, things greater than what we can ask for. Yes, we ought to ask, for he is able to do far more abundant than anything that we might ask, as the Apostle says. And all things must work to the good of those who really, truly trust in him, unashamedly, unabashedly, even when they are in prison, even when life is going poorly, even when the questions are there. Friend, the lesson of this passage is, firstly, we should go to Jesus, that he is the answer to all of our doubts and fears and all of our questions. That he has the ample supply for all of our weakness, the balm to heal our wounds. That he can give us rest in our weariness. That he can restore and revive us in the ministry of the Holy Spirit and empower us. And he works through us to do all that he will. The lesson is this, that we should go to him and trust that he shall answer us. The lesson is that we should not be ashamed, for he was not ashamed. He was not ashamed to enter Jerusalem humbly on that Palm Sunday from 2,000 years ago. He was not ashamed to be betrayed by one of his own. He was not ashamed to stand up under false accusation, to be beaten, mocked, and scorned. He was not ashamed to be publicly humiliated. 
and to suffer death on the cross and to be laid in a grave where he did not belong. He was not ashamed to own you in all of that. So why should we be ashamed of him? Because his commandments are rigid and they go against the wisdom of the world? That's folly. Because he demands that he is the only way, it's not a wonder that he is the only way. The wonder is that there is any way. Because he does not appear as someone the world would esteem. What are these reasons? What are they but folly? Oh, Holy Spirit, may you open the eyes of the blind even this day and unstop the ears of the deaf, that they might hear this good news being preached, wherever they are, and they might respond. O oh, Father, have your way in their hearts, and call them to yourselves as the prodigal. Let them see that they are in a worthless position. Let them rely upon your mercy, O oh, Lord Christ. The work that you had done of old, continue to do it. Softly and tenderly you call, may it be heeded, and may we never fear to draw nigh to you with our questions and with our burdens, casting them at their feet, seeing that you do not crush bruised reeds or snuff out smoking flax, seeing that even with one that might have been expected such greatness, you forgive and have mercy upon a moment of weakness. O Lord, in our weakness, may your strength be made perfectly evident. May we find your grace perfectly sufficient as it is. In all of this, may you be greatly glorified. In Jesus' name, amen. Today, if you have heard the word of the Lord, if you have seen a picture of a Savior who is meek and lowly, who is gentle, who would heal hurting souls, who would restore sight to blind and hearing to the deaf, strength to the lame, who would cleanse the leopards, who would even raise the dead, who alone can raise the dead, having conquered death and sin. If you have heard this good news preached, you must respond. Right now, he stands ready to receive. Right now is the grace period. But the day of judgment is coming. And then you shall have no more opportunity to repent. You shall have no more opportunity to say, I am not ashamed of Jesus Christ. I shall own him as my Lord and as my Savior, and I shall be his, and he shall be mine. Your faith on that day shall be sealed for all eternity. While well, today is yet today, seek him, and you'll find him. For this one testifies with John the Baptist, and with Matthew, and with all the saints down through the ages, and with the Spirit himself, that it is so. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God the Father and the fellowship of God the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.